Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk coming to you from Cape Town today. The South African Constitution has been hailed as one of the most emancipatory doctrines by people all over the world. In fact, Archbishop Desmond Tutu recently wrote that our Constitution is so inclusive, so tolerant and so compassionate that it would make God proud. But while we may have a constitution that is regarded as one of the most progressive in the world, South Africa is entering its third decade as a democracy. And the defining feature of our country is that we are a divided nation. South Africa is the most unequal country in the world. How do we reconcile this contradiction? How does a country that has such a forward-thinking constitution allow such a backward situation to exist? My guest today is an expert on the South African Constitution and we are going to talk to him about how the South African Constitution is responding to South Africa's biggest problem, our nation's inequality. We are talking to Professor Pierre de Foss. Professor de Foss is the Claude Leon Foundation Chair in Constitutional Governance and he teaches in the area of constitutional law at the University of Cape Town. Welcome to Saxes, Pierre. Thank you very much. Pierre, I'd like to start the conversation off by asking you a very basic mm. question because when we talk about something so important, it's important that people understand what we're talking mm. about. So can you tell us what the purpose of a country's constitution is before we go any further? Yes, if you have a, a, a constitution that is a supreme constitution and a normative constitution, it does a few things. Firstly, it actually sets out the rules of the political game how Parliament operates, how the Executive operates, how the courts operate, and so on. So that's the first thing. Secondly, it then uh, contains protection of the rights of, of individual people. So that even if you are not part of a political majority, or if you're unpopular, or if something, for some other reason, uh, you are threatened that your rights will not be um, recognized or protected, the Constitution does that and it can be enforced by the courts. So it, the Constitution really is not only, say it sets the rules of the game, but it's also supposed to impose a kind of value system on society. Um, so it, it contains certain values that finds their way then into the Bill of Rights and into those specific rights that protect everybody's rights, or is supposed to at least. So what's so special then about the South African Constitution? Why is it hailed as such a progressive document? There are many uh, traditional constitutions across the world that is more old school liberal constitutions. And those constitutions often uh, see the biggest threat to individual citizens uh, as being the state. Our constitution uh, is a little bit different. It says that uh, power is held not only by the state, it's also held by big corporations, it is held by ins other institutions that can also easily affect your rights, whether it's now a big cell phone company or whether it's a mining company, as we know from Americano or anybody else. These are, all, uh, these are all huge role players with a lot of power and the constitution binds all of them, not only the state. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the Constitution contains a whole set of rights that are not traditionally included in the Bill of Rights, a set of social economic rights, like a right of access to housing, a right of access to health care, right to education, you would be surprised to hear, um, right to environment, healthy environment, and also an equality cl clause that says equality is not really about just treating people exactly the same because that will just freeze the status quo and the inequality but that equality is about the end result equality is about substance who, whether in the end uh, people are capable uh, of actually fulfilling their true potential and it requires therefore some positive steps to be taken and even for people to be treated differently so that everybody has a fair chance. That's very different from the old school liberal constitution which says you must be treated the same whether you are the poorest or the richest person because it doesn't matter whether you have an equal chance in life 
it is just whether the law is going to treat you equally. I'm very interested in this aspect of it that talks about people achieving their full mm. potential. You know, our constitution was meant to be a bridge from our divided mm. past, taking us into a more inclusive future where everybody would reach mm. their full potential. But clearly, it seems to have failed dismally in terms of achieving that goal. I mean, why do you think that's the case? Well, you know, the constitution is not a magic bullet. I think for some of us, at least, when the constitution was adopted, we thought it will change everything. We thought that the, the judges will come, they will make robust rulings, forget about the politics, and they will just give people all these rights and it will just rectify the injustices and the inequalities. But of course, the courts have limited powers. They are not elected, so they don't have the same kind of legitimacy. So it depends for its realization, not only on the courts, but also on the legislature and the executive. And I think there has been some difficulties in the, on the part of the legislature the, and the executive really to come to grips with the equality, with this uh, really disturbing those deeply entrenched apartheid patterns. Um, so you need the court to make judgments, of course, to try and disturb it, but in the absence of the legislature and the executive really taking seriously uh, this issue, you're not going to change anything. So that's for that reason why, for example, if you look around you, it's so surprising that you still get townships there far away from the city where people are poor and then you get the city where uh, people are relatively uh, well to do. And they, th those barriers have not been broken. The policies have not been implemented to actually deliberately try and break that apartheid thinking. And so I think that is one of the reasons at least uh, for, for the constitution not fulfilling its complete promise because it's, it requires political will also uh, and, and you, c you can't only require or rely on the judges to do this. Does our constitution say anything at all about economic justice? Because that's one of the drivers of our yeah. inequality. <coughs> The constitution, you know, it's, there's a lot of discussion in the academic circles about what values are actually underlying the constitution. Because when it was negotiated, you can imagine, it was the ANC, it was the then National Party, FW de Klerk. So it was always going to be controversial to include specific economic goals or programs. But let me just stop you there. Yeah. It's been pretty specific about a whole lot of other things. Yes, but I think the, for, for reasons that has to do with the, the realities of 1994 uh, and the fact that there was really also not only a political compromise, there was also an economic compromise where all the big companies and big business and the ANC basically agreed that, well, if you leave us alone, we will leave you alone. So, in that context, political context, I suspect that it was not thought possible politically and economically to actually include those things in the constitution that will fundamentally threaten the vested interests of big business uh, and so forth. Um, and so, it, it, it was never included. So, the question then is, as it stands now, is there anything in this constitution, any articles that we can use to bring about a more just and inclusive yeah. society, to bring about this economic <clears throat> justice? Or are we talking about perhaps constitutional reform mm. going forward? Yes, they, I mean, you know, it, it also depends on how it's, of course, it's interpreted by the, the courts. So I, I have criticized our courts sometimes for being a bit too timid and not for not embodying a more progressive uh, social justice uh, the, uh, vision of the constitution because judges although the constitution it's law you cannot just judges cannot just invent things but there are always a little bit of leeway for interpreting the constitution either a little bit more to this side or to that side and the courts have been relatively conservative because lawyers are usually quite conservative in their politics um, but despite that, I think there are provisions in the Constitution that can be used very powerfully. The, the property clause, for example, there's a whole section there that says 
um, land reform is not only permitted but it is required and you don't the willing buyer willing seller kind of uh, policy in which you have to pay the market related price only to somebody who is willing to sell their farm that is not in the constitution so you don't have to have that you can, there could be a far more radical land reform program that is going to cost far less than has been the case for the last 20 years if there had been political war so that's one thing the equality clause Although it doesn't include a prohibition of this on discrimination based on uh, economic status, it does say that you you have to you cannot be discriminated against um, uh, 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 because uh, of your circumstances. So I think the lawyers also we us as lawyers can do more. For example, to use that equality clause along with other clauses like there's a right to education, as I've said, in the Constitution, to challenge, say, the policies, existing policies, which entrench the unequal education system. Because education is one of the, the root causes of the continued uh, skewed inequality. And, and the courts have said that it's going to be very powerful if you can invoke equality with another right like the right to education or the right to housing or health care or whatever, to, sh to say, well, this, there are these huge inequalities and the state policy is actually, instead of breaking that down, it's perpetuating it. So, but for that you need clever lawyers, of course, and sadly this is the way the law works, you need money, because the lawyers don't work for free, it costs a lot of money to run a case, and you need one or two brave judges. Uh, the Constitutional Court has been relatively good, but maybe it's time for them to be a little bit more brave. Well, I'm glad you touched on this issue of the lawyers themselves, because yeah. my next question to mm. you was going to be about people who engage in social justice mm. activism and who use the law and the Constitution mm. to advance the goals of social justice. Do you think that people are thinking creatively enough mm. in terms of applying the law? I think it depends who we talk about. It's difficult to ge generalize. I think uh, there has been a social movements, say like uh, one movement that is always held up as an example is the treatment action campaign. Mm -hmm. Because what they did, they understood that you don't always win only by going to court. You can use the court strategically along with political work. The problem with especially lawyers is that us lawyers sometimes think, well, you can solve everything by the law, you don't have to politically organize people, you don't have to ensure that citizens are active as individuals, that they actually claim their rights, that they fight for their rights, because often I think the change happens not in the courts, but it happens on the ground. Some organizations like the TAC uses both, and have used it both, and then it works very well. I mean, if you think today, we have a program of antiretroviral provision that in 2000 didn't look like it was ever going to happen. Why did that happen? Because the courts were used, but 20, 30,000 people were marching here to Parliament um, to demand it as well. And Kosato came on board, you know, the alliances were made. So one has to be politically more strategic, I think, about how you use it. Um, so that's the first thing. And then secondly, um, I do think there's more scope for, for looking at those provisions in the Constitution where you can really get to the inequality issues. I appreciate your comments about um, the socio-economic rights and how we can be more creative mm. about um, trying to ensure that people get those. But I mean, the defining structural problem that we face is one around a distribution of resources mm. and wealth in this country. Can you try and think about ways in which we can apply our constitution to bring about more redistributive measures in our country? Yes, that, that is very difficult actually to, uh, yeah, because I don't want to pretend that the constitution is going to be this magic thing that, that can actually change it. But the, uh, if I think about it, I think the, there are, of course, ways in which it can be done uh, in the sense 
uh, of, for example, read the, the, the equality clause already contains provision, a provision that says that redress measures, affirmative action, whatever you want to call it, that that um, is not only permitted by the Constitution, but the Constitutional Court has said it's sometimes required because if you don't have redress measures, you just continue in the old way. And I think there are interesting ways in which we can start thinking about that jurisprudence of the court. To say, how can we apply affirmative action kind of principles, not only in the employment field, but in the field of, say, education, healthcare, uh, you know, the, and so forth. Um, and I think our courts will be a little bit amenable to that kind of thing because it, they already know affirmative action, they endorse it, they think it's a good thing uh, if it is done in the correct way, sometimes it's not done in the correct way, sometimes nepotistic, but... Um, so yes, there are some avenues for that. What it cannot do, and that I think that is what we have to be honest about, the Constitution is not really the document that is going to change the economic policies of the government. The voters are the ones that will change that. Because voters, it's not only, the constitution is not the one with power, it's the voters who have the power. And the voters have to demand from those political parties that they vote for, or even the ones they don't vote for, to address these inequalities, to begin to transfer wealth um, in ways that are, of course, complying with the Constitution. So there are certain rules you cannot just uh, take away from, say, somebody's house without any compensation, unless the EFF comes to power, maybe they'll change it. Um, but the citizens themselves, I think, th there's a need for citizens to, to understand that they have a role to play and that they allow the political parties to present them with these what is sometimes rather limited options about uh, addressing the inequality. Professor Pierre de Vos, thank you very much for joining us at SACSIS. Pleasure. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service. And remember, if you want more social justice news and analysis, you can get that at our website at saxis.org.za.